All right, so if you'll go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash evidence management, you can become a member of the Facebook community group. And uh, lots of people are a part of that and, and good communication going on. So if you have questions about anything in the world of evidence management, that's a good place to be. All right, well, let's get started with today's topic. And today we're going to talk about data security and infrastructure overview, the never ending pursuit of perfection. And I want to start out and, and just make it clear, this is not meant to be a, a, an extremely exhaustive overview of data security. Um, I want to give a little bit of um, information that I think will be good for people to hear, uh, may probe you to think a little bit about how you handle data on your end, maybe how what you do to put your, your organization into a good position or a bad position as it comes to security. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about our infrastructure because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, I'm going to use it to explain how we go about doing security in our world. I mean, this is my world, information security and, and network and web-based systems. So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. So generally, the single greatest threat or security threat to any organization is you and me, along with some human error and bad practices. When you take any one of those components and begin to put it together, you have a foundation for problems. And I wanna give an example about this because I'm here to talk about information security today. And I, I would like to think that I know a little bit about the topic, it's what we do as a company, but it wasn't very long ago, I'm, I'm sitting here at my work computer and I had a text message on my phone. And this thing popped up and it said, um, <clears throat> it was an alert, it was telling me that the post office had a package for me and I could look at that and tell that the, the link was not right. Um, I never, ever received a text message from the Postal Service. And every fiber in my being um, was activated to avoid clicking on that link. I just, for some reason in my mind, there was something for me. And if I didn't click on that link, I was going to miss out on it. So I did not click on the link, thankfully. I did a very little bit of research and found out quickly that, that this was a new thing that was popping up. And you're probably all very aware now that text messaging and sending out um, spam alerts and, and, and phishing tactics are, it's incredible now. I'm sure you all received election things via text messaging and you're wondering, how do these people get my cell phone? Um, but this is the beginnings of problems when you simply click on these links. And I almost did it myself. Now, one of the things I like to do within our company is when these things pop up, I'll send out an email to everybody in the company as just a constant reminder and alert. Hey, you have to be vigilant about things you're receiving because this right here is how the problems really begin. Now, I just want to give you a, a, an FYI, a side note. I always bring this up anytime I talk about security, because to me, one of the greatest security risks in the world are people. And, and, and I don't know any of you online here listening. This may be you. It may not be. But your bad practices when it comes to password management is a huge problem. OK, um, I and everyone in our, in our company uses a product called LastPass, where we will store all of our passwords for everything we log into. And, and, and people are encouraged, if, if not demanded within our company, that every time you log into a website, you need to be using a different complex password. I myself probably have 500 different websites that I log into for some form or fashion or another, and I have a different complex password for every one of them. And the point of doing that is, if any one of those passwords is compromised, I don't compromise everything. And there is no doubt, there are people listening to this here today, that you use the same password for everything you log into, and you're one step away from that being compromised and everything you log into being compromised. And so just as an example, one of the sites I log into is Wayfair, and that is my complex password that I use. This program that I use will allow me to generate as long a password as I want. So if it's a very sensitive system, I may have a 20-digit password uh, that will be stored. And, and encrypted and everything that goes along with that. 
this isn't one of those really major fundamental things when it comes to security, but I, I think it's very important. And I just wanted to throw that out to everybody. I think that's something that everybody should, uh, should be doing. What can we learn from known failures that are out there? And you don't have to go very far or do many Google searches to find out some really bad things out there when it comes to data breaches and security. And I'm in the Cincinnati area. I don't know if anybody on here today is from, from in or around Cincinnati, but it wasn't very long ago that um, one of the uh, RMS systems that 20 different departments, including the city of uh, Cincinnati and Hamilton County were using, they were using a product called PAMIT. And, um, they lost all their data. This wasn't even a security breach where it was, and, and I don't want to minimize it because any security breach is bad, but there's a difference between um, somebody has accessed your data and we have lost all of your data. And so for 20 departments in and around Cincinnati, they actually got the worst part of it, whereas we were storing all of your data and it is now all gone. And so when you think about situations like that, it really makes you think, what happens if somebody were to call me up and be like, we lost your data, it's gone, it is unrecoverable. And to the same tune, um, something that <clears throat> has become really big over the last couple of years, um, and that is um, where, where your data is encrypted remotely by somebody. And so in this scenario, you are hacked, somebody gets into your network, but instead of trying to delete your data or, or, or stealing it and sending it to somebody else, they literally encrypt it. And the only way you can get it back is to pay them to unencrypt it. And, and if you dig into this, there are cities and law enforcement agencies that have been hit by this. And, and they may be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars. Either A, they don't get their data back or they have to try to recover it, or for merely $100,000 or whatever the number is, you can pay this company in Bitcoin, by the way, and they will give you the unencryption key and you immediately have all your data back. And, and these things are really bad when they hit because not only are they a publicity nightmare, um, but it, it makes you look incredibly bad when these things happen. And I promise you, some of the beginnings of this are simply clicking on links and emails or, or clicking on something that you almost know you shouldn't be doing and you do it anyways and it opens up this potential Pandora's box. Um, somebody did pop in and ask the, uh, the question, um, is that LastPass for the passwords? Uh, LastPass is the password storage manager program. So not only is it where you store all of your data about your passwords, but it allows you to generate out passwords and all of that. So very good question. Um, as an FYI, generally, you are far more likely to do something unwise and cause a problem than you are to be hacked. As if you're just sitting in your office one day, minding your own business, you don't do anything, and all of a sudden you're being attacked. That is the very unlikely scenario. The much more unlikely scenario is you do something to cause the problem, or somebody around you does something to cause a, a problem for you. And so some of those things that I want to classify them as dumb things, but they may just be a, a better word as unwise things. And I see this all the time. You store sensitive data on a device with a single point of failure, whether it's a thumb drive. I cannot tell you how many departments I've run into where they store all their body cam video on a single USB drive that is sitting out in the open and, and people have access to it. I mean, Somebody can steal that device, but even more likely, that thing fails and you lose all of your data that is on that thing. And so anytime you have a device with a single point of failure, you are seriously running the risk of losing everything. Another really big one is you're not backing up your sensitive data and even more importantly, testing the restore. Going back to that PAMIT situation I explained a little bit ago where, where 20 organizations lost all their data, they had servers in place with data redundancy and they were doing backups, but guess what? Nobody ever tested the restore of that backup to find out there was a problem with it. 
And so, you know, generally when things like that go down, it's multiple degrees of incompetence that are that are coming together at once and creating this this situation. Another thing is nobody plans for something going wrong. Nobody sits down and says, what happens if that device fails? Because if you did that, you would probably say, wait a minute, that's a big problem. Do we want to risk that? And so just planning for something going wrong is, is incredibly important. All right. Now, I'm about to dig into our infrastructure, and I want to talk about our software for a minute. The purpose of this is not to dig into our product, okay? I, I try to avoid that when I do these webinars. Um, I'm trying to convey information um, that I think is important, and sometimes it just happens to be best conveyed because it's wrapped around our software, okay? But what I'm explaining here could be applied to, to any web-based system that is out there, and these are things you may need to be aware of so that you can ask the right questions. So we do have a security uh a paper on our website. In fact, most organizations that do what we do, they're going to have a white paper or some security document that really digs into all the weeds of what they do. And I'm not going to go through this document, but my purpose today on this call is to is to lightly overview the things that are that are in here and put you in a position to ask good questions of of different vendors you might be working with. But if you do want to dig into it and go into far more detail, um, just go to trackerproducts.com forward slash security and you'll you can review our security white paper okay to me the basis for security is compliance okay compliance is almost the definition for what are we going to do to be compliant and so for, for us, in 2020, we hired our first compliance manager. I mean, we're getting big enough now. It's, it's, we're in a world now where, where law enforcement agencies are becoming far more aware of security threats and compliance and standards. And so we as an organization, far more than 15 years ago, I mean, 15 years ago, almost nobody asked any questions at all. They didn't even know the questions to ask. Well, in today's world now, you have compliance and standards. And so we get that all of the time. And so one of our big pushes in 2020 was to become compliant with SOC 2 and even CEGIS compliance. Because here's how that really breaks down. When an organization is looking at our software, especially if they know what they're doing, they may have 500 different questions they want to ask about how do you handle this? How do you handle um, encryption? How do your firewalls work? Who has access to all your data? And again, 500 different questions. CGIS compliance is 500 individual standards. And so in the end, you could come to me and say, hey, I've got 500 questions or we could be SOC 2 compliant. And then most people are like, oh, okay, I know what SOC 2 compliance means now. I know what CGIS is. If you are compliant in that regard, I feel a lot better about working with you. And so that is something that we have been heavily focused on this year, getting all the policy procedure and standards in place so that we can then go after the SOC 2 compliance. And so we're, we're knee deep in working on that right now. All right. The next level is simply the infrastructure of where all of this stuff is housed at. Now, when I mean infrastructure, you know, infrastructure could be that USB drive that is sitting back in your, your intake evidence room and all of the officers are walking in and, and, and downloading all their body cam onto it. But that's one, you know, aspect of infrastructure. Infrastructure get much larger and much more expansive. And in our case, I'm going to show off some pictures of our infrastructure here in a minute. Our infrastructure on Amazon Web Services is, I mean, it is a large infrastructure. There is a lot going on in there, okay? Um, but it is important to understand some of this infrastructure. Where is your data stored at? Who has access to that data? And so as I dig into that, Here's a screenshot that gives you a very general overview of what our network infrastructure looks like on Amazon. Now, from my standpoint, the most important thing I want to convey is data redundancy in everything. OK, we don't have a single database where if something goes wrong with that database, 
the whole thing goes down. And we have multiple database infrastructures in place. We, we store media, all the pictures. I mean, we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of clients that are uploading media into our infrastructure. And all of that is stored in Amazon S3. And, and I'm going to show a really cool statistic about that in just a moment. But I just want everybody to be aware that our cloud-based infrastructure, and most, I, I will say most, most organizations are going to have an infrastructure that looks like this, where you have multiple layers of redundancy across different regions of, of a system. That PAMIT system did not, you know, so when, when it failed, it failed colossally. All right. Now, something really cool. I just, I found this statistic a while ago and, and I, Again, maybe I'm the only one that finds this interesting, but I want to read this out to you. Um, the Amazon S3 cloud storage, okay? So uh, it, uh, you may not be familiar with S3, but it's their simple storage solution. And so it's where all of our media is being stored at. And I, I think that our bucket inside S3 has millions of, of media images inside of it, all right? But here's the statistic. The Amazon S3 infrastructure and Amazon Glacier are all designed to provide a 99, you get all the nines that are in a percent durability of objects over a given year. This durability level corresponds to an average annual expected data loss of that number. But here's the, the, the real world example. For example, if you store 10 million objects, let's just say it's 10 million um, one megabit pictures. Now that's obviously a lot of pictures, but let's say you're storing 10 million of these pictures on Amazon S3, you can on average expect to incur a loss of one image every 10,000 years. So that is a high, high level of durability. And that ultimately breaks down to where it is so improbable that you're going to lose a single image um, or even one in 10 million images over a very long period of time. When I read that, and I know that's very complex, but when I read that, that makes me feel better that, man, there's a lot going on there. There are technical engineers that their job is to make sure this stuff is up and running. I feel significantly better about my data being there than I do on the hard drive sitting in my house where kid picks it up, drops it, drops a drink on it, and all of a sudden I've lost, you know, however many objects are, are on that thing. So just wanted to throw that out. I, I find that to be a, a cool statistic. You don't just have, I mean, and when you think about points of failure, all right, so for us, we have a, a web-based product. Um, you have infrastructure that can fail. You have people that can fail and do things the wrong way. But you also have on top of that coding and development that can be done wrong, okay? Because you could have the best infrastructure in the world and you could have people doing all the things that they should be doing, but all of a sudden you've got code or, or old libraries in place and it opens up a port for somebody getting into that thing. So on our end, um, we make sure that as we develop software, number one, we're using the latest frameworks and libraries and we're constantly updating our servers. So you know how you have that Windows laptop that you never think about updating and all of a sudden some IT guy comes down and he's like, hey, it's been a couple of years since we've updated this and you know, then they have to update it. We are constantly upgrading or updating all of our servers, making sure they're patched and updated and all of the, uh, the antivirus stuff and the malware stuff is in place. You know, that is our job to make sure that stuff is on top of it because when you do that, you're less likely to have problems. Remember what I said earlier, this is a constant pursuit of perfection. You will never attain perfection. You're just trying to limit your exposure as much as possible, okay? Um, we use coding practices that do prevent unwanted access to data. I mean, literally, the, the worst problem in our world would be telling somebody we lost data, or the second thing would be if we had unauthorized access. Now, as I get into this a little bit deeper here in a moment, I'll explain to you all the different areas we go into to making sure that our code is, is good to go. 
Um, our development team does code reviews. Everything that is developed, multiple people put their eyes on that code to make sure that we're not developing things that, that are going to create a problem. Now that's that's putting eyeballs on it, but there are also systems that I'm gonna get into a minute that will will even further check all of that, okay? Our development is always done with permissions first mindset, all right? Every time something is developed, the very first thing that is considered, how does this affect security? Because in the end, everything below that is, is way secondary to that, all right? And then the last thing is we also use password managers for all of our, our data access. So now we've developed code where we, we the code is done, the eyeballs have been put on it, we feel good about it, but now we take our code and we submit it into a quality assurance process where we have a team of people that will analyze the code. They'll use software tools and they will try to find security flaws within that because we don't want a client to find that. We don't want to receive a phone call someday where somebody's like, hey, we found a bug in the software. And, and inevitably we do get calls from people where, hey, we found a problem, but I know today that is far less likely. I would be willing to bet that 99 out of 100 flaws that are developed within our software are found by our QA team. So it is, it's, it's certainly rare that something will roll out into production because they've got they've got a lot of systems that they use to reiterate and go back through things that have been developed. So we are every time we develop something, it goes through the entire gamut of testing before it goes out into public. Okay, the next one, and this is critically important, is penetration testing. We hire a third party company to attempt to hack our software. They are using the same tools that, that hackers will use to attempt to find security flaws and holes in your infrastructure. So this group will use a whole, I mean, they, so I listed out some of the standards that we use or some of the different things that we try to comply with. The OWASP top 10, those are the big, so if, for anybody here that's into coding and stuff like that, that's where you get into cross-site scripting and SQL injection and things like that. So again, this third-party company will test it, attempt to hack it, and then they come back to us with a report that says, here's what your grade is, and if they find any flaws, we will fix those flaws before that stuff ever goes out into, uh, into production. And on top of that, something else that will, will allow you to feel better about this um, is some of our larger clients that actually have internal teams that will do security testing on software. Um, we have those people that are constantly testing our software and every once in a great while, they'll come back and say, hey, we did testing and found this hole in your system. And so I can't even imagine the amount of testing that goes into our software, including pen testing, before something ever runs out into production. And then next is disaster planning and recovery. So our compliance person, you know, so imagine you're in an evidence room and you have a water pipe running overhead. Our compliance person would walk in and the first thing they would say is, what happens if that pipe burst? What happens if if somebody gets through that door over there or uh, whatever, or, or I mean, it's amazing some of the evidence rooms and the, like, like just windows to the outside. I mean, a, a compliance person would walk in and would say, does somebody have access to that window from the outside? What happens if they get through that window? And so disaster recovery planning and recovery is going through the exercise of what happens if that thing fails right there? And so we make sure, as, as I mentioned earlier, we, we don't have any single point of failure in the system as much as can possibly be. And then we do full snapshots of all of our systems every 12 hours. I mean, we, are, we, are, we have redundancy built into the system. We're doing snapshots and data backups. And then we're storing those data backups on that S3 infrastructure that I told you about a little bit earlier, where you have you know, a chance of one in 10 million objects of data being lost every 10,000 years. And I would still even tell you as I throw all those things out and, and I hope you sit there and you're like, man, that sounds really awesome. Like these guys are really on top of it. At no point do we sit back and say, hey, that's good. We don't ever have to do anything again because I don't want to be that organization that 
all of a sudden we have to call our clients on the phone and suggest our system has been compromised or we lost data. And thankfully in 15 years of doing this, we have not lost a single piece of data. Now we have had clients lose data, probably a dozen different clients have lost data and every one of them were on-prem systems where we weren't in charge of the systems and the backups and the security. And there is no more heartbreaking feeling than somebody calling on the phone and saying, hey, that server with that data is now gone. And they almost call me up and look to me like, what can you do to help me? And unfortunately, my answer is, well, we're, we're happy to reinstall the data or the, the system, but if you don't have those backups and all of that stuff, it's gone. And so, you know, that that's why in today's world, I think what happens is most people look at what I've just laid out right here and you understand what we're doing. And this is our job every day to keep on top of it. And most people now in today's world, they say, I'd rather my data be on your end than on my end. Not, not particularly for lack of faith in your own IT people, but in the end, you know this is our job and, and, and it's, we've got to keep on top of this. And you're, you may not be so sure about things on your end. And so, again, this is what we do. And then the very last thing I want to throw out, and, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you want to, I think that, that maybe most importantly is your culture and your accountability for all of this stuff. We are constantly talking about this. This isn't just something every once in a while we break up on our bring up on our end. It's the lifeblood of our organization. If we fail in this regard, we fail monumentally. And so we cannot afford failure on this part. So we are constantly talking about it. Our compliance person is putting things in place to, to, to pursue that level of perfection that again, we won't attain, but we're more, we're moving more in the direction of. And so I would encourage you if, you know, at least look at some of the stuff on your end, because you, many of you are housing critical digital evidence on your end. And I would encourage you go back and ask your people what kind of redundancies are in place? What happens if that USB drive fails? Because you may be the person that helps open that up and you can avoid a colossal nightmare of data loss or a security breach or something else. And simply asking the proper questions can help immensely. Okay, again, that was not a, you know, a, a, a major overview of data security. It's just some of the things that I think are really important. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see anything coming in particularly. Um, hopefully, at the very least, you're more comfortable about what we're doing on our end as it comes to all of this data, because it's, it is something we spend a lot of time on. Okay, I may have a question coming in. Um, it looks like maybe they're typing it out, but um, it's not here yet. All right, well, you know what? Um, yeah, I'm just getting some comments back now. So that's all I have to share today, guys. I really appreciate everybody showing up for this. I, I hope that, again, my goal is always that you can pull one thing out of this and take it back and use it. And if, and if that is the case, uh, then this was certainly worth the time. Everybody have a great day and we'll look forward to seeing you in a few weeks at our next webinar. Bye-bye.